Hello. Hi. My name's Alex. And my name is Val. And we're going to talk about Sopranos. Season 2, Episode 11, House Arrest. This is a podcast. Called In at the End, where we watch Sopranos and then we immediately come and talk about it and we kind of go over our reflections on the show. Yeah. This is our infinite time watching this show and every time we kind of try to uh, get deeper and deeper into what's really happening with the Sopranos. Yeah, and I think it's funny, like, I've been thinking about doing this and I feel like if we did this every time we watched it, we'd probably have really different things to say. Mm-hmm. Um, so it is I think for sure, like, even compared yeah. to like our last viewing, yeah. this is a show where it really brings out different things from you depending on you know where you are and what you're thinking about yeah so maybe once we finish recording this podcast mm-hmm. the whole show all the seasons then we just have to start again we'll just do a new one and at the end too the sequel yeah it'll be amazing like the godfather too yeah and then our third one will really dip yeah um but yeah so these are just some of our the things we notice that's at least for me a lot of it's just like things that stand out to me especially in this episode yeah. Um, and then we do try to delve into like the, you know the deeper messages and the symbolism, philosophy, the philosophy, symbolism, colors, metaphors, similes, similes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, two eleven house dress. So an amazing team on this one. Yeah. So we have it. It's written by Terrence Winter and directed by Tim Van Patten, who are two of probably the most active members of the Soprano team as the show continues. Yeah. No, it's funny how Chase really, like, he tries out a lot of people in Mm -hmm. season one, and then we even start to see now, like, his favorites. Yeah, I mean, by the end also, it's, like, even more refined. Totally, totally. Uh, To the point where, actually, I think it's Terrence Winter. I mean, it writes, like, I mean, like, over half of the last season. Oh, really? I I think so, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, those two guys are obviously... Um, the best of the best and I think this episode is like you know is it one of the ones that stands out to you like uh, for plot points obviously not there's not a ton of really like relevant story shaping um, action that goes on there's not even necessarily a lot of new character development it's actually almost like rehashing things Mm. that have already happened in a lot of ways Interesting. What it's almost like cycling say... back. I mean, I think we do go deeper into characters, maybe some more than others. In particular, like Melfi, I think, mm. is being expanded. Mm. But, you know, a lot of the other characters are just kind of, like, repeating their past actions. I mean, Tony right. is kind of just falling into this, like, malaise. And yeah. just kind of engaging in things that he's... I mean, it's a little bit different because now he's, you know, kind of going a little bit more legit, going to Barone. But he's kind of falling back into depression. He's not taking accountability for his actions and the realities of why he feels the way he does. Richie's kind of fucking with him over and over again. And yeah, interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we'll probably we'll probably visit each of the characters or at least some of the main ones at some point. I mm-hmm. want to see how that unfolds for you. Like if you feel like all the characters. Well, I think were... it's character by character. Okay. I mean, I think like. Okay. Janice is like her transfer as, as Tony says like your transformation is complete yeah so or no I think he says you've completely transformed yeah but yeah yeah completely different <laughs> I like that though your transformation is complete <laughs> that would be a weird line of dialogue <laughs> Janice your transformation is yeah, complete it's very robotic it's like <laughs> but I mean she has really transformed from the beginning of this season so in terms of her arc in the context of season two, she's somewhere completely different than she was in the beginning. Oh, yeah. And at the end, I mean, her and Richie are looking for a house, this kind of, like, monstrous New Jersey house. And Is that the one they end up getting? Well, I think, actually, it ends up getting... Ye- uh, we'll see. Okay, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not get too far ahead wait, of ourselves. Wait until next episode. Yeah. <laughs> So one thing actually with the house is um, when Tony's like walking away and Richie is in it. Yeah. And he says, you poor bastard. Right. I thought that was actually interesting because like this episode is called House Arrest. Right. Junior is obviously under house arrest. Right. Tony's kind of. Under house arrest. In a 
manner. You know, yeah. I mean, he's kind of sticking around his house or Barone, but he's basically confined to this domestic life as opposed to the other sides of his mob life. Mm. Seeing Richie in that house through the window behind the glass with Tony saying, you poor bastard, there's something about, like, all these characters are in jails of their own making, mm-hmm. I think. And, you know, from the last episode we talked about in the bathroom with Vuk Mus- Vic Musto, the um, wallpaper guy where Carmela's in them, and there's this kind of, like, vertical line pattern mm-hmm. that, like, makes it really seem jail-like. And then Tony ends up being back there after he realizes that he got off, too. There's something about him being in his house that this kind of, like, house arrest aspect of, like, he's in a jail even when he is in this house. Or maybe particularly when he's in the house. Maybe particularly when he's in the house. And then also Richie, Janice has kind of been pulled into this orbit and she's looking for a house. And there was something about seeing Richie behind the glass that was kind of like imprisoning or something. Yeah. So I guess we deal with a lot of that throughout this episode. And we can talk about how different characters like deal with their confinement. Yeah. Or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Definitely. Um, yeah, where do you kind of want to start? I don't know. A lot of my things are like kind of. Okay. I, I went well, through it in a timeline. So if you want to yeah. pick a character or pick something, well. Well, how about the very beginning, the first scene with dumping garbage? Yeah. So, I mean, we've talked about, and they've talked quite a bit in this show about, you know, garbage being their bread and butter. But there was something about just kind of like the imagery of seeing them just like dropping the garbage as like a tool mm-hmm. and just like leaving it with somebody to deal with Mm -hmm. also like that person too like they were kind of just standing up for like you didn't come on the right days like you didn't do your job i'm getting paid you know double yeah and they're just like fucking with them yeah for again like kind of for fun like it's different than the like the good citizenry of the last episode but there is something to it it's like somebody's just kind of standing up for what's appropriate and right and then they like punish that person yeah because that gets in the way of their benefit yeah. from, you know, messing with people. Yeah, for sure. And then we have a cut scene. It's just a scene of a bridge. Mm, I know. I saw that. It's and then it goes like to the lawyer, no right? And then you're in no. the lawyer's office. I was thinking yeah. about that in terms of, like, an establishing shot. I was like, well, I guess they're in Newark where the lawyer is or something. It looks like that place we went to that diner. Hmm. It was good diners in Newark. <laughs> yeah. I think it is that bridge. But, but, um, but it does make you yeah, think. Well, yeah. we were talking about that kind of like, quote unquote, establishing shot last episode when we were talking about how we had a scene in the Soprano home, a shot of outside the Soprano home, but then we were still back in the Soprano home, right? Like, yeah. I think the way they used it in this episode was more of like the typical establishing shot. Like now we're in downtown Newark. Right. Maybe, but even still, I mean, bridges have been. I mean, yeah, that is a shot of, of a bridge. No, I mean, obviously, they've been it was asso- associated with death too. I mean, yeah, I don't know. Um, and then we go from that scene at the lawyer's office, yeah. right, where he's like in- encouraging Tony to, you know, spend more time at the legitimate yeah. businesses. Um, and then we go to that weird couples therapy session that Melfi's having with that couple. Right. You said you think that the guy I, is Terrence I'm, Winter. I think that the guy, that guy is actually Terrence Winter, the writer. And also, I think that that guy is also the one who shows up in Guy Walks Into a Psychiatrist's Office, the episode, who's talking about his problems with the woman. The one who, like, goes to her hotel? I think so. Room? Okay. Yeah, because that would be... Anyway, yes, I think okay. so. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I kind of want to, after this episode like or after watching this episode go back and revisit all of Melfi's scenes over the past two episodes at least to like think about the fact that maybe she's drunk Mm. because she was acting really weird interesting last episode yeah um and she was definitely like whatever she said to the couple she was like it was so cheesy it was like two years one mouth listen to each other right and they left and she said something else to Tony, too, like, oh, yeah, she was like, I hear depression talking, which is, like, a weird thing for Melfi to say. It was, like, very... Right. Um, <clears throat> I forget the word. I'm like, like, armchair psychiatry kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know, kind of cheesy. Um, Her tone has definitely changed from the first season. Yeah. I mean, it seems, like, less how I think of traditional psychoanalysis, like, coming from Freud being it's yeah. it's very different like it actually is like almost condescending a lot of the time 
or yeah well she's like it's her unhelpful. own personal shit like that's, yeah. co- that's coming up yeah and i think that like you know in this episode she's a character actually who there is some development for her as a character in this episode in particular yeah because she's getting worse yeah you know um you know we have that cigarette scene is interesting where yeah she's just basically losing it and um one thing that I thought was really interesting about that, too, was there's a couple times where Melfi isn't really, like, owning up to her behavior right. in the same way in that she's criticizing yeah. Tony. Well, there's a few things. Like, in the cigarette scene, she turns to the woman and she says, your cigarette is affecting my son, mm-hmm. basically. Like, your smoke is getting into his lungs. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, I mean, clearly it's something that she's upset about, but she, like offloads it onto him for an issue that like he's an adult and he has agency but she like makes it about him he he chose to live in a smoke-free dorm he chose to live in a smoke-free dorm then when she's talking to kupferberg you know she says i embarrassed my son that's how she starts it so again it's about her son and her actions like on the impact on her son and then later on in that session she says about the drink she says i won't drink with my son yeah. So it's all about, like, the way that it affects somebody else rather than the way that it's affecting her. Yeah. So she's kind of unable to process what she's doing to herself or something. Mm-hmm. Like, she's kind of, like, using her son as this kind of, like, I don't know, projection of what's happening sure. or why it matters. Well, I think that's a very Freudian kind of analysis of that, right? Like, that it's impossible to analyze oneself and that people project. Yeah. Right? Like, that's... I'm sure that Chase was trying to elicit that and it's also, in that character. Yeah. No, totally. It's you know? also um, interesting because her last scene is where she's talking to Tony about yeah. alexithemia, right? Right. Which is... Ooh, thanks for writing that down. I just wrote down <laughs> the shark disease. Shark disease. <laughs> <laughs> well, alexithemia. Good yeah. word. <laughs> good Scrabble word if you have can work so off... So many the, some I don't know. <laughs> some other words already in there. Um but this idea of keeping moving to stop from taking in abhorrent behavior. Yeah, stop and you from how what, having time to think. how what one does affects other people. Um, like not taking that into account, mm. right? Like not thinking about how it affects other people. And that when they actually stop moving, they crash. Which is I interesting for her. I love the word crash her. in terms mm-hmm. of like the uh, dream that she had about Tony. Right. Yeah, which is something I've been thinking a lot about actually, that I dream. We were thinking- More... And more that I've been thinking about it, I, I really think that the interpretation that she had is incorrect and that this kind of, like, deep reading of, like, she's required to help him and that she could help him, you know, save him from a panic attack or save others even, perhaps, is different than her subconscious kind of screaming at her that she's out of the woods if he dies. That actually... That, that her subconscious kind of recognizes the toxic effect that Tony has and that she's actually better off and out of the woods and out of danger if she's not treating him. Mm-hmm. Anyway, that was just kind of something that I was thinking about. But I, I was thinking about this idea of, like, stopping... Like, people crash when they stop to think about their impact on others. Mm-hmm. And she kind of... I don't know. Maybe it plays into a little bit the fact that she keeps on referencing her son and the impact on her son. Maybe she's actually kind of recognizing the impact that she's having on others now and thinking about the impact that she has maybe even on her other clients. Like you were talking about these very kind of like cliche pieces of advice that are Mm -hmm. different from than the side of her that we got in season one. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's part of her crashing is that she's kind of falling apart, having been brought back to Tony Soprano and that his hold is really kind of, you know, yeah, I mean, what is Melfi's issue? Like, what is it that she's going through? Because I don't think it is that she's obsessed with Tony, right? Like, Kuferberg's giving her these this medication for, like, an OCD medication, yeah. basically, right? Like, is that the issue? What, like, what's Melfi's issue? Well, there's also the scene where she's talking to Kupferberg about how she's Inextricably, inextricably drawn to Tony Soprano. Like, yeah. It's like a train crowd, train wreck, I yeah. think she says. But she talks right. about, it's like... it's like watching a train wreck, yeah. Yeah, but then she goes into detail, and she says, like, there's a part of her that recognizes, like, how toxic it is. That's not the word she uses, but, like, 
she can't help but want it. She knows it's bad, but like there's like a like a voyeuristic side to it. Mm-hmm. Right? Well, it's interesting also in light of the dream because she's like watching this car wreck. Right. Yeah. It's all like, yeah, it's, I don't know. I I don't even, I don't think she's an alcoholic either. I think right. like I was annoyed with Kupferberg in the episode because yeah. he was like really dwelling on it. Yeah. And she was obviously, again, there's no black and white. There's no, you know, like is she or isn't she? It doesn't really matter. That's kind of the issue, right? It's like, is her behavior one that we can put in this category or that category? That's what medicine tries to do right? right but like she's obviously going through something yeah um that is eliciting this kind of like self-destructive behavior but i don't know and then but she but on the other hand she is like bargaining with kupferberg about like oh well i won't drink in front of my son right then, you know so which is like an alcoholic or an right. addict type behavior um yeah i don't know i i I'm thinking more about Melfi yeah. on this watch. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I like I don't know what her, like if she had a good enough psychiatrist, not <laughs> Elliot Kupferberg, like what actually is wrong with her? What actually might some solutions be for her? Well, we haven't seen it yet, but, you know, in an upcoming episode, there's some short scenes with different psychiatrists mm -hmm. and one of them you know kind of takes like a very like hardline approach to some of these issues mm -hmm. and i feel like that's a stance that hasn't really been examined yet at this point in no. the show is just like removing yourself yeah just like cutting loose from it yeah, but, because yeah. yeah but melfi wasn't okay when she was cut loose from tony earlier too do you know what i mean was like... she i mean tony seeks her out Think about the beginning of season two. Yeah. He's finding her at the diner. We don't know how she was doing. She mm -hmm. wasn't doing okay because she had been drawn into Tony's orbit to the extent that one of her patients had died. Yeah. And she was treating out of a motel. No, but I... how was she doing? Mm -hmm. Personally, I mean, outside of like after that, those horrible problems had remedied themselves. Or if that hadn't happened, mm -hmm. she wasn't responding to the troubles of that specific situation. Mm -hmm. You know. Perhaps actually she, like her mental like health at. would have been better. I don't better. know. I feel like it's hinted at that she wasn't doing that well even then. But I can't think of a specific moment that yeah. does that. So Maybe. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's just my, mm -hmm. my imagination. I mean, she's kind of a peripheral character. And her only like purpose in the show when she com comes in is to come back to Tony. So mm -hmm. I don't really know. I like that she brought up the movie Sliding Doors. Mm. It's a movie that I often reference in my life. <laughs> I don't know that much about Sliding Doors. Yeah. A lot of people don't, which is what makes it a really weird <laughs> reference <laughs> to use. It's kind of just strange for most people. But it is a really interesting movie, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. If you, you know, it's like shitty Memento. <laughs> oh, okay. Not really. It's not like Memento at all. But it's... It's 1990s? It's 1990s. Oh, it's like 1990s. Gwyneth Paltrow. Mr. Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> no, she, well, I, <laughs> well. <laughs> you didn't see that movie. I, you watched I, I that don't, movie. I don't know why I watched okay, that movie. Okay, Sliding Doors. <laughs> Main premise. This woman, Gwyneth Paltrow. Mm -hmm. She gets on a train or she doesn't get on a train. And then it tells the two stories that happen after. Right. So like what happens if she makes the train and what happens if mm. she misses it. Okay. And so I think that in ter for Melfi, this is all related. It's right. a good thing that I have an understanding of it's the movie good. Sliding Doors. There's a lot yeah. that I'm not going to get into. Maybe I'll have to do a whole podcast on Sliding Doors. I could do a whole podcast on Seven, too, which is also a reference. Okay. <laughs> we'll do a, a, a double feature on those movies. But um, lots of stuff happens. But for Melfi, that is kind of the thing, too. Like, what would I guess that kind of is answering our question we were just talking about is, like, what would her life be like now? if she hadn't taken Tony right. back or hadn't taken Tony as a client at right. all, right? So I yeah. thought that was a good reference and it was relevant to what we were talking about a second ago. It's also interesting that Melfi brings up sliding doors and then turns like, fuck no, seven, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Like the, the relationship to the movies and what those two movies are yeah. also is, is kind of interesting. Yeah. Yeah. All right, that's good, Melfi. There's a lot going on there. Yeah. Um, One big thing. So, okay. So, for me, what, the big what, thing what? in this episode is boredom and yeah. tediousness, tediousness and, like, the mundane. 
And, you know, earlier there's been a quote that's been referenced of in life, you have to choose between boredom and suffering. And this episode is really like almost like a study of Mm. boredom. Mm. And actually, like, I'm just so impressed by kind of like the ambition of making an episode like this in TV, where that's such an ambitious thing to do to like choose boredom and to kind of like show it at every turn in the episode Mm -hmm. and still feel confident enough that you can hold people's attention. Yeah. And there is something where they reference Marshall McLuhan and nobody gets it except for the nurse. Right. I thought that that was actually kind of like a pivotal moment, even though it's just kind of like thrown over everyone's heads. And it's not really clarified, but there's a lot of moments. It's actually like kind of deep, I think, because there's like multiple moments where the dialogue is a little bit more everyday in terms of like there's a lot of like long pauses. Yeah. It's awkward. Or like conversations that are like really meaningless. They're just like you're like snippets of people's conversations. Totally, yeah. Yeah. You know, between Junior and Catherine, we have, like, you know, like, oh, maybe Friday you could come. And then there's, like, long pauses and it's awkward. When they're in front of the cider press, there's just, like, not even, like, communicating. And then they'll stop. Like, there's just, like, it's much more real, actually, in that way. Because those things actually do happen. But that scene with Marshall McLuhan, like, that doesn't get clarified. Nobody really knows what it is. And they take the time to focus on that. To focus on people not getting it, kind of passing it around, the right. awkwardness of the situation. Right. Um, but it's interesting where they're talking about Marshall McLuhan, who, being from Canada, both of us, we have a soft spot for him. <laughs> but, I mean, his the main thing that he came out with was this idea of the medium is the message. And where that gets interesting is Chase is working in TV, which mm-hmm. is such a long, drawn-out, artistic medium where he has so much time to make statements and Mm. to connect things and i think that that's what he's doing in this show and that's really what he's examining and this episode about boredom and everyday life can be more profound and can be more linked into the series and the ideas of the series on the whole because of the time that it has Mm. and a movie couldn't do that and the medium of tv is patient it is drawn out And it has the ability to tell these, like, very kind of, like, long stories. And the domestic aspects of The Soprano Home, which are kind of the focus of this entire series, kind of are communicated so well through this TV show and through this medium in a way that some of these ideas have actually never been examined through Mm. anything else previously. Mm. And I think that that's really key. Like, I mean... It's, it's different to even look at Sopranos now in 2018 because TV has kind of exploded since then. Right. But when I think about what HBO did, TV was not like a preferred medium for like heavy hitter auteurs no, or no. directors. or And there wasn't really like a huge body of work of things that are really like communicating on this level or have this many levels. Um You know, I think about a lot like Alan Ball when he did American Beauty and then he went and made Six Feet Under and that was like rather radical Mm -hmm. because he was going into TV, which was like a more unrespected medium than it is now because there wasn't precedent of these like incredible shows that, you know, take you from one place to another and benefit from the time that they have and are made by these like incredible crews and are like, you know. Well, I mean, Sopranos like basically invented what tv looks like now it did i think so i think yeah. i mean i haven't watched northern exposure or whatever he did before the sopranos, sopranos is a pretty pivotal moment for yeah. tv i mean it, it really takes it somewhere yeah. and i think that it uses the medium like it it gets it it gets what the advantage of these long stories are what you can get from totally. an 80 episode you know 80 plus episode series um and that's been That's really opened everything up because now, I mean, there's a lot of shows that are created at a very high level and have a lot of thought that are put into them and and can draw, like, really serious talent to produce them, whereas it was more difficult before. Yeah. No, for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, this whole – the whole series is, like, meta on itself. Like, it's just, like, there's so many layers that you can explore – and nothing is ever, like, unidimensional in this show. Like, there's always some kind of deeper layer to it. Yeah. How about Tony in this episode? 
from the beginning to end. I mean, there's a lot of focus on him and a lot of time spent with him. I feel like he's contemplating a fair number of things, and he actually has this, like, whatever it is, panic attack, or he, he passes out while he's at the golf club. And one thing that's interesting there is they actually establish the POV shot. Right. Where they focus in on Tony's face, and then they go to what he's seeing. And for those of you who have seen the whole show, that's a huge part of the last scene. That's what comes into a lot of the theories about what's going on. And they do use that a couple times throughout the show, but... In this... In this instance, it's used to see all those silly white people dancing. In this instance, it's used... Well, actually, yeah, in, in a lot of, like, their dumb conversations about, like, not rubistics, but, you know, essentially rubistics. Yeah. Like, you know, just, like, whatever kind of random chatter they have. Yeah. And I think that's leading him to think about, you know, like, what is there in life? You know, there is this aspect of, like, what is the purpose of if this is all that there is that he's surrounded by? Um... And, you know, I think this whole episode, this idea of him being detached from the mob is leading to him being depressed because he just can't really deal with it. He's drawing these, like, doodling this, like... Fishbowl. Fish in a fishbowl. He seems trapped. Um, you know, when he's in his house, there was a few... There was a few interesting scenes, like, near the beginning where he's in the room and he's looking out the window and he's, like, contemplating whatever's out there. The pool. Yeah. And... I think there's another scene too where he's kind of there, there's a few scenes where he's kind of um like by the windows and you can kind of see like the nature in the in the back um but there's the kind of just this like nothingness that exists in his life throughout the entire episode like he doesn't really go anywhere it doesn't really lead anywhere he's just kind of putzing around depressed with no real purpose and i mean for me that's like a pretty bold move by the show to commit to that for a whole episode, especially this close to the end of the season. It's kind of incredible, actually. What did you think about the scene where he goes through Carmela's book group? Yeah, I mean, for me, like, that's actually the scene where I wrote down that there you could see, like, that was right after the scene where the gang calls him. They're saying... Okay, you have all this World War II haul, which is, like, tailor-made mm -hmm. for him. It's, like, right mm -hmm. up with his interests. You know, it's the Jeep that Patton drove, which in well, the last episode... it's actually, like, during that scene that that happened. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. And then, so, like, right after, he looks over at the woman, you know, in the book club, and he's clearly, like, disparaging or just doesn't want to be a part of it. And then he also... That's also when we see, like, this, like, greenery on the other side. Yeah. So I feel like he's, like... He's kind of contemplating what his options are. And taking in the realities of the eternal or something mm. or the afterlife or like, what does it all mean? Like he's thinking about these deeper philosophical questions and yet he's surrounded by this domestic life that he doesn't really care for and is leading him to boredom. He's looking I for other know. things. I think he actually saw Carmela and her friends in a positive light. Oh, interesting. Think. Yeah. Like I think he was kind of envious, like she's with her friends and they're all like laughing and they're all like surrounded by this warm glowing light in the room maybe in this image and then he misses just doing like being around his guy pals yeah you know interesting know, that's how i saw that i think he yeah i mean i definitely think he misses being there i think that that's he misses his guy bo pals boyfriends boy pals <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah i mean that's a scene that you know is written like that is like tailor made for him. I mean, that's like the ultimate thing that one could think of him wanting to do. Mm -hmm. And so it's sad that he can't. But then he's so happy then when there's, you know, dudes looking at porn together and making pasta sauce. In the end. And uh, whatever else they're doing. I love how when and he... he's so happy to go and be with them when they do that. I love how when he gets there, you know, he turns and he sells, you know, basically like some of the only dialogue is. What so? What else is going on? And yeah. The response is nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Which really plays into the themes of the show. Yeah. Hesh is weirdly there. I don't see Hesh as like. I didn't think out he would be there. Guys. In the back of Satriels. I mean, what a great surprise! Playing cards with Christopher. <laughs> <laughs> they get to see that car crash. That's... Right. Again, a crash. Even that though. Yeah, but even that, like, that is a seemingly exciting event, but it's not. Like, they're all just there, like Polly's tanning. They're all like, tanning. super involved in it though. Yeah. 
And then, you know, they're just, but they're going over and telling him, like, not to speed. Like, what could be, like, a, I don't know. Like, it's clearly, like, something that's happened before. And there's something, like, so anticlimactic, anti-exciting about, mm-hmm. like, these guys, these mobsters, like, going and telling somebody to not go over the speed limit in their exciting car. And then, you know, it leads to a crash and they're all kind of brought in. But there's really nothing going on there. Yeah. And much more than almost any other episode that's happened in the show so far, if you think about all the developments that happen in that episode, there's mm-hmm. a lot less than there typically mm-hmm. is. And, I mean, I do think that's the point. Yeah. Um, even in the first episode, you know, I feel like this show really, like, established Tony as our narrator and as our protagonist. Mm-hmm. So the tone of the show reflects what's going on in his life. Right. And so right now, if he's detached and removed from the excitement and the mob life and he has to kind of step away from it, then it is going to be a more mundane show, like more boring. I think that that's like the tone of it. Yeah. Well, I like how, too, like Agent Harris shows up at the end. Yeah. And that was the thing at the beginning of the episode that Tony's lawyer was like telling him was to like, the feds are following like they're following you Mm -hmm. you know like at some point they're gonna get sick of just following you and they're gonna pin something on you so you have to be careful so go to these offices right yeah like but then i love that agent harris and he always has a new partner every time he shows up um he shows up and sees just like the most mundane shit going on like there's like nothing yeah going on also why does agent harris have such a soft spot for tony why are they friends so that's i remember i mentioned that youtube channel mm-hmm. before yeah that, like puts characters the ben mckayse and complete arc yeah the complete arc of characters you watched the complete agent again, harris there's a complete agent harris arc mm. and it's interesting oh that is interesting <laughs> you'll have to watch it i would love to watch that um we'll yeah put it, we'll put it in the comments we'll put so it you in. can watch it too yeah i love this youtube guy yeah he he this is just know. like a bunch of letters, right? Yeah, just a bunch of letters. <laughs> um, but yeah, I thought that that was interesting too in light of like the, well, we also see Pussy like turn and go into Satrials, right? Like everyone else is outside and Pussy goes away. Right. But in light of, you know, the other federal investigations that are going on, yeah. most of the guys, like Tony does have this special thing with Agent Harris. Yeah. Um, you kind of still see him as a little bit... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? Like that nobody can get him. Right. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I thought what about Junior getting stuck for in the kitchen sink. There's something about that, too. Just like the helplessness. Like he's descending, too, as a character, mm-hmm. too, into his age and his helplessness. Mm-hmm. And that sleep apnea machine. Yeah. And, I mean, there's a pretty far cry from the first season where he's, like, the main power player. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's really it's really kind of fallen down quite a bit. And also just, like, in an episode that really deals with boredom and mundane things, like, to think about him just kind of, like, stuck there, too. Like, the passage of time, too, yeah. the way that that works. Like, Well, this episode has funny passage of time throughout. Like, mm-hmm. you don't really know what day it is or what... You know, like what's going on, and it is kind of just that boredom yeah. element too. But yeah, definitely the time with Junior. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Did you have anything other things in your notes? No, nope, not really. I mean, I had a few things on Junior and Catherine. Mm-hmm. I just felt like like, but it was more about like just being old. Mm-hmm. Um. I like you know with the cider press in the basement and yeah, um, bunions. <laughs> and um, I don't know, like even when he like calls the operator to get her number or whatever, he right. like does it the old fashioned way, like if, as if there were a person on the end of the line. Like right. it's just this kind of like declining. Right. Um, yeah, the and, world like, he, he knows like, is the, the dirty joke he makes to the nurse who comes. Right. Like she's just kind of like laughs at him. Right. Um, yeah. Anyways, I don't know. It's just <laughs> random thoughts. But. To the point where actually she, he talks like, why didn't she come back? Like, clearly she was yeah. uh, <laughs> put off by the whole interaction yeah, to a exactly. point where she just didn't even want to have any part of it. Yeah. Um, um, I have Tony eating ice cream bar next to fruits. <laughs> that's good. There was a lot of orange juice. Yeah, there was. So orange juice always uh, means something exciting is coming down the 
pipeline. Maybe they just really like orange juice. Maybe they just like orange juice. We'll see. We'll see what happens in the rest of the season. Um, the show. In the show. <laughs> well, thank you for listening. We'll be back soon. We're getting very close to the end of season two. Mm-hmm. And now I'm excited. There's to some very these last two of them. Very incredible episodes coming up. So, yeah. if you've been watching this far and you haven't seen the rest, you should probably keep watching. Yeah. Alex wants you to email him. No, actually, he wants you to write a comment. <laughs> oh, sure, you can do that. That'd be nice. Yeah. You can write reviews. You can uh, let us know if you email like us. It. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate it, and um, we'll see you next time. Okay. Bye.